All right. All right. Why do we do this? Why do we keep doing it day after day, documenting the slow motion train wreck that is World War III? I don't know, but we're going to keep doing it. This massive uh, carcinogenic conflagration that you're seeing behind me here, that's in Moscow, the heart of Moscow, in fact. Like many fires that are raging around the world right now, they're in Russia. Some of these are proven acts of sabotage. Others are just unexplained. Why this is so important is that in the run-up to Victory Day, there's a lot of mysterious things going on. Victory Day is Russia's cardinal holiday, okay? It's one of their most important holidays that they celebrate as a culture to commemorate those who have fallen during World War II, of which there were 20 plus million people, I do believe. And it's a very important day for them. I'm gonna tell you what else is of critical importance at this juncture. One of those things is the fact that the nuclear power plant in Europe, the largest one, in fact, in Ukraine, is being evacuated as we speak. All along the front lines, evacuations are taking place. There is an increased amount of bomber activity. As I do this video, Russian bombers with glide bombs are en route to Ukraine. Try to put this in perspective, folks. Vladimir Putin just thinks that we tried to assassinate him. Moscow is burning and a counteroffensive is beginning, which may beget a nuclear attack, if not in the very least a radiological incident. You see where this is going. The most optimistic of, of experts at this point, with the exception of Kissinger, who we're going to talk about today, are saying that this only ends in a victor. Somebody has to be victorious. And unfortunately, when one person is victorious in this equation, that begets the use of nuclear weapons from the opposing side. So please put this in perspective. I know it's a slow motion trade wreck and it's hard to remain focused. Many people's adrenal fatigue on the issue of World War III is starting to wear thin. And I get it. But understand that this is the time to be buying the dip. And by that, I mean preparedness. This is the time to be using this relative state of peacetime before the storm, because think about what's, what's going on here, okay? You're talking about a massive war with a nuclear-powered nation, nuclear-armed nation, the most nuclear-armed nation in the world, who just recently said, their top diplomat just said the following, that the attack on the Kremlin was Cassus Belli with Washington. All of the top Russian diplomats are of the belief that in the very least, Washington was the one who was in some way instrumental in this attack on the Kremlin and may possibly have been trying to assassinate Vladimir Putin himself. That is the thinking. Cassus Belli, the criterion for that, have been met according to the Russians, which means that they're at war with the United States. Okay, do you get it? Do you get the picture now? You cannot prepare enough for what might potentially be coming. And a great metaphor to understand this, I'm gonna take you all around the map and talk about the news stories in greater depth today, but just hear me out for a second. You look at the attritional rate on the front lines, whether it's Bakhmut, Russia. Russia knows that the long form strategy of this is economic. If their economy can be resilient in the face of all these sanctions, which it appears as though it is, if they can maintain a strong economy, that is all that matters. It doesn't matter how many tanks you lose, doesn't matter how many guys you lose, because this is a war of attrition. You know, I can't remember what the quote is, but you know, war is about logistics. If you can get the ammo you need to the guys who need it, when they need it, you will win the war. And that is really what it boils down to. Can Russia maintain a robust enough economy to win the conflict? But I want you to apply this to your life because you see the burn rate of manpower and resources, the rate of expenditure of ammunition. I mean, we're talking about probably hundreds of thousands of rounds just to kill one guy. So to put in perspective with your own preparedness planning, okay, we, we have this delusion that, you know, okay, we got three months worth of food squared away and that's going to be enough, enough to carry us through a situation, like a worst case situation, like we're talking about here. I have a sneaking suspicion that that's not going to last you one-tenth as long as you think. 
for a variety of different reasons, whether it's your, your own burn rate, uh, you helping out other people, maybe you get stuff stolen from you, which is why you need to be watching our home fortification video that we just put out recently and our other home security videos that we've done in the past and all those blue strip videos they get widely ignored because people just want to sit here and titillate their adrenal glands and that's what happens people get burnt out and they get bored and it's on and on to the next TikTok. but look at what is going on the russians just think we tried to assassinate them they have a shitload of nuclear weapons they're deploying them in places that are not typically deployed we have no more strategic arms agreements moscow is on fire they've been canceling victory day parades they're pulling people back from the front lines in anticipation of a major radiological radiological incident and there's all types of canards about what is actually going on on the front lines whether that be ukrainian propaganda or russian propaganda the fog of war is so incredibly thick right now and it may just be the case that the Russians are as transparent as it appears and that there is no opaqueness to, to Putin's strategy here and that it, it is just what we see. They're just struggling to keep pace. But I mean, these guys have had months to prepare for this so-called counter-offensive. So either they got some tricks up their sleeve and they're trying to do the old bait and switch and Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, who predicted that the Russians are feigning weakness in order to encourage and coax the ukrainians into a meat grinder type counteroffensive situation because a couple things are going to happen here guys in the next few weeks when this counteroffensive ensues they're pulling people back right now they're evacuating people they only do that when the shit's about to hit the fan historically that when they start evacuating people out of these regions the war is coming it's coming right now it's coming in hours coming in days a worst case scenario, I'm going to predict at this point, weeks. I don't think we have weeks until this counteroffensive officially, not kicks off because it's not going to be declared, but until it becomes obvious. Um, if the counteroffensive is successful, which it very well may, because like I said, if the Russians are as transparent as it makes out, as they make out, and uh, they are just fumbling, trying to play catch up to what the Ukrainians are doing or currently have the initiative, it appears, then uh, we're in a lot of trouble, okay? A lot of trouble. I know there's people who are just gleeful about the prospect of pushing the Russians out, but these people don't think. They, they, don't, have, they don't have good analytical capabilities because anybody who's looking at this situation uh, from a geopolitical analyst point of view and understanding what the consequences of certain things are going to be. If Russia gets pushed out of Crimea, bad things are going to happen. I know people just hope that, oh, they're just going to fold. It's going to stay conventional. They don't have the balls to press the button. They don't have the balls to press the button. <sighs> Man, we're playing with fire. We're playing with fire. Now, I'm not saying this is a matter of preference. I'm trying to look at this situation objectively. If the Ukrainians make headway, if they bump the Russians from some of the annexed territories, I think the only ones they're going to have any hope in hell of doing so from is maybe the Kyrgyzstan region, Zaporozhye, and Crimea. Uh, but definitely not, definitely, I, I don't think the Donbass, but I could be wrong. What do I know? I don't know what they have planned. Okay, there's lots of planes, there's lots of rumor and hearsay floating around this whole situation. But either way, if the Ukrainians get baited into some war they cannot win and they get annihilated, then what happens? Uh-oh, NATO starts to freak out or Ukraine starts to freak out and somebody does something provocative to pull NATO into the conflict. I'm telling you, we are getting down to the minute. And I know peop some people just love the excitement of all this, right? It's like a movie, but unfortunately it's a movie, but it's, it's just slow motion. But please do not relent in your preparedness. This is the time that you're going to regret not committing 10 times the amount of time towards actually doing functional things, towards building up a supply, educating yourself, how to do ham communications, 
how to do first aid, advanced first aid, how to store food, how to grow food, how to hunt food, how to defend yourself. Okay, just how to start thinking like a prepper. The time is now to go and just download all our old videos and any preparedness stuff you can find on the internet. Because this shit could spiral out of control really, really fast. Everybody's gonna be waiting for the green light from the media to freak out. You don't wanna be that person on this issue. There's a reason why 1% of the people rule the world. It's because they can see what's about to happen in the future. Not because they can predict the future, because they are uh, mediums or uh, because they are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, clairvoyant or anything like that. It's because they just kind of can think a few steps ahead. And you got to be that person right now. You got to see what is happening in this situation, regardless of what they're not focusing on in the media. And you got to put the pieces together for yourself. Because understand that it's only a very, very small minority who has ever throughout history, whether it was World War I, World War II, Napoleonic Wars, the Civil War, who could have predicted what was about to happen. It was only a few. I mean, everybody probably had a hunch that it could happen, but the normalcy bias, bias was rife in the majority of the population, and the, that still stands today. So, now is the time, okay? Now is the time to not relent. That doesn't mean freak out and run around, phone up your neighbors and call your family members and be that guy at the dinner table who just won't shut up. It just means <clears throat> speak softly, carry a big stick, and be ready for things to just get so out of control that you can't believe. That could never, as bad as it ever could be depicted in the movies, squared. Okay? Wow, 11 minutes and 50 seconds in. I haven't even started the damn video yet. Did I mention that Canada is on fire <clears throat> right now? This is what's going on in Canada, okay? We got huge wildfire conflagrations. I'm gonna get back to the war stuff, but I gotta, gotta give a shout out to my Canadian peeps who are shrouded in smoke. So this is Edmonton. This is a city of about 1.5 million people. It's a very spread out city. It's a huge city, okay? That's the size of Edmonton. These are the size of these fires. Okay, the outline part here, that's the size of the, that's how much space has been actually burned. The thick red smoke, that's where it's thickest and you can show where, it, where it's blowing here. This is firesmoke.ca. Now, I believe that an area the size of one of our provinces has already burned. And this is a very unusual amount of fire activity. We're talking 100 times the amount of land has already been burnt this year than is typical. This happened on several occasions. In fact, it happened in 2011, 2015, but not to this extent. It happened in regions in the far north in Fort McQuarrie where they were very populated regions. Now it's just happening in the nether regions. This is also happening in Siberia. So in addition to World War III, you need to understand strategic relocation, the, the most commonly forgot about thing by people who think they're just gonna run off into the forest is forest fires. On a long enough timeline, the forest that you're in is going to burn. And uh, I don't know a whole lot about making fire breaks and this and that. Maybe we can go and do a video collaboration with uh, the fire department that we know here to talk about that very thing. But it's something you, you need to be mindful of, that there is no 100% safe space. There's always, even if there's low population density, you're living in a wooded region, it's great. You have an abundance of wild game to hunt and no marauders around for 100 miles. You have to contend with nature, with lightning. Some people are going to say this is arson and that may well be the case. To that, I always say wildfires like this on this scale don't burn unless the conditions are ripe to foster it, to facilitate it. You can go out and you could light forest fires all you want. If the conditions aren't there to sustain that fire, and which they are right now due to drought and high temperatures, unusually high temperatures, as we've been talking about for some time, then this is what's gonna happen. Anyways, let's get back to the World War III stuff, the man-made stuff. Okay. So somebody's calling me here. I gotta say, can I call you back later? All right. 
Nuclear plant being evacuated. I warned people about this this week, last week, that this is going to be top of mind on the news cycle this week. And sure enough, here we go. I mean, a blind man could see this coming, no offense to blind people, because it's right at the crossroads of where this supposed counteroffensive is supposed to start. There's all kinds of conjecture about what's going on there. Are the Russians putting a bunch of explosions in there and this, that, whatever? I don't think that that's particularly true. I do believe that they have fighting positions at the nuclear power plant because understand if this plant goes, then that whole region, both the Ukrainians and the Russians are going to suffer as a result of it. So I do think, I hope that both sides are going to be intelligent enough to avert a nuclear catastrophe and uh, keep the fighting away from that region. I'm actually quite confident that that might be the case, but you just never know. Because the problem is, right now at this point in time, if this counteroffensive does not succeed, there is going to be a vested interest in pulling NATO deeper into the conflict. I believe the United States just committed yet another $1.3 billion. I mean, you can't even keep track of it. At 700 million last week, at 2 billion the week before. I mean, what are we at now? hundreds of billions of dollars when all is said and done because the weapons that they are sending right now for us to actually build those very things are likely twice as much as what they're valuing it at because of the cost of raw materials, the supply chain, the whole nine yards. All right, we got Russian bombers in the air en route to Ukraine. What is the, the grand strategy? Is there a strategy here? I think that the strategy with the Russians is primarily that of, like I said, maintaining a robust economy. Because as long as they can maintain a robust economy, the Russians historically, they got a lot of guys to throw out problems. People talk about the population, birth rates going down and the lack of able-bodied males. They got 140 million people. If you include the annexed territories, it's now 150 million. They got enough bodies to outman pretty much any European country or any collective country because I've talked about the drawbacks of coalitions. The drawbacks of any coalition, be it NATO or otherwise, yeah, when you add all the numbers together and you add all the GT, GDP numbers together, it looks like something. But you need to understand is that those countries don't have unconditional trust for each other either, okay? <clears throat> they're not gonna be putting all of their best forces, they're always gonna be holding back their best for such case that they get invaded. So you can never, it's never a one-to-one -one thing. So if NATO collectively has 100 tanks, each country is only going to send a fraction of their tanks. So Ukraine's only ever going to get 10 tanks. So this is how it works. And then Russia will go and they'll take one country and they'll, they'll get close to another. And then once they take over Ukraine, Poland's going to have to fight the Russians. And maybe something flares up with Poland at some point. NATO gets involved. Right? What does that really mean, though? That's the question. Because Russia has the advantage, just like Germany had an advantage in World War II. Because they have a very, <clears throat> they have one of the largest armies still compared to all of Europe combined in terms of uh, manpower, I do believe, still with manpower, the ability to mobilize forces, and probably just in equipment still as well, as well as just uh, technologically, they, they still do have an edge with the exception of maybe some of the things that the United States can bring to bear. I'm not a military expert, but <clears throat> they don't need to have the amount that Russia has doesn't need to exceed the amount that NATO has. It only needs to exceed the person they're fighting in that moment. And as long as they have a regenerative economy, which they do have, they have the largest, well, the largest uh, mass of resources in the world, and a pool of resources, I should say, in the world, and they have a large population, that, and they also have this relationship with the Chinese. So they could foreseeably continue to have a strong economy, even if their attritional rate is just slightly above what the Ukrainians is. Because you look at the lack of debt, you look at the relatively low inflation compared to other G7 nations, and uh, <clears throat> you start to see the truth about this situation. It's not looking good. So if the Russians win, it's World War III. If the Ukraine wins, it's World War III. So do your level best to get as squared away as you possibly can right now. We have this canard about the hypersonic shootdown. First, the Ukrainians said, 
yeah, we shot down a missile. Then they said, no, we didn't do that. We, we don't want to be giving, you know, false sense of confidence. We don't want the, the United States to think we got this case or whatever the thinking might have been. Uh, but anyways, I, I believe there are people in high up positions who said, you know, this is false. These claims about us shooting down a hypersonic missile, which would be very substantial if true. Although the proof is very tenuous at best. It, the images don't seem to bear that out, but depending on who you talk to, it's pretty much a guessing game at this point in time. But then, of course, they come back and say, yeah, it actually was. We did shoot it down because it's like this morale boost thing that they're going for. Whatever the case, I think it's, uh, you know, the proof is going to be in whether or not the Russians continue to hit their targets. There was a major explosion in Odessa at a Red Cross facility that had a bunch of food aid. Now, the Red Cross is supposed to be an impartial organization. And I'm, I'm certain that for the most part it is. But in a major conflict like this, when there is so much at stake and there's a clear Western bias, I'm sure that the Russians probably thought to themselves, maybe they're feeding the Ukrainian soldiers these MREs. That's probably what they thought, okay? I gotta read you an email from somebody about what's going on in Finland right now. Big stuff is happening there. Germany bans Russian flags on Victory Day. So you got Germany banning the Russian flag. Think about this, think about this. NATO, according to the Russians, just tried to assassinate Vladimir Putin. They're banning the Russian flag in Germany. There's leopard tanks, German leopard tanks, fighting on a country called or named after the front Okay, the frontier fighting against the Russians. I mean, you know, what, what more is there to say at this point? You know, sometimes I think I should just uh, get a new hobby because, it, you know, we, we try to encourage people to prep on this channel, but it's futile. Like for the majority of people, it's futile. It's the algorithm's fault, it's, but it's people's fault. At the end of the day, you know, people, just when you think that, you know, maybe we're becoming more enlightened as a species, people just fall for the same old shit time and time again. Even after the last three years, people are gonna fall for it all again. Just wait, just give it a few months and we'll be primed and ready for the next hoodwink, all right? We got Cassius Belli with Lavrov. We got gold buying hitting another record in Q1, according to my man, Peter Schiff. Did you guys know that Andrew Tate just bought a massive survival bunker off uh, Atlas Survival Shelters? We got Ron coming here this week, and Ron was the first guy to, uh, I think, interview the Tates, so he claims, when they got out of jail. Uh, it doesn't matter what you think about Andrew Tate. Okay, you need to, and this is something, this is public knowledge. This is, uh, there's a lot, of, you, typically there's non-disclosure agreements when you build a bunker like that with Ron. He's very, he honors those, and I'm a pretty close friend of Ron's, and he doesn't even tell me the celebrities that he builds these bunkers for, but I can tell you, among a few, that they're very, very well-known people. I mean, the Kardashians, Tates, like, I mean, people that, you know, are out there in, in the public eye. And, uh, Understand that they're prepping for this because they see the 1% see, they see it. But, you know, the 99%, the they don't want to see it. They're too busy protesting shit in subways. And as much as, you know, you want to take a side on that issue, is that the best approach to be taking at this stage in the game? Nobody's focused on this. And I'm not saying everybody look at what I want to talk about. I'm just saying... This is something that is going to have global repercussions. Even Warren Buffett is bearish at this point in time. Even the guy who is notoriously overly optimistic about the United States, the guy who says always bet on the USA, he comes out yesterday, I believe, in a uh, presentation that he was given, like a three-hour speech with him and Charlie Munger, a guy's like 99 years old, and he says, uh, yeah, the last six months, that was the end. That was essentially, he said more or less, that was the end of the golden age of the American empire. We're now in a state of decline. So uh, people need to pay attention. The gold buying hits another record. Central banks around the world bought, I think it was like three times the amount of gold, or was it 33% more gold this year above the highest year ever recorded. 
And that's gold. That's not ter in terms of the, the nominal value. That's the real, in real terms, how much gold they actually purpose. I think it was 230 tons more this year, okay? Because money, the US dollar, may well be worthless if there's any banks left to hold the dollars and distribute them by the time this is all said and done anyways. I've already talked about prepping is excessive and you need it. But let me reiterate. You see, you, you see it in these wars. You see this massive buildup of the military. Why do we need to spend trillions and trillions every year on weapons? And then you look at how fast, once a war starts, you look at how fast all that stuff gets burned off and you're like, oh, that's why they were, that's why they needed all that stuff. Same thing with prepping. Nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. What's that, that phrase in, uh, in Taxi Driver? Uh, Robert De Niro, he's like, you know, every day is the same, every day, you know, the same old streets, the same old, you know, sidewalks, and then one day, change, right? And it, it's, it's just how it is. Nothing changes, nothing's gonna happen, then all of a sudden things happen. What's another uh, quote? Another good one is, it takes, there are decades where nothing happens and then there are day or weeks when decades happen. Okay, that's the best way I can encapsulate that idea for you. And war economies. I just wanted to briefly talk about war economies before I get into the details here. A lot of people say that war economies are inherently a bad thing and are bad for the overall health and well-being of a society because you're just making weapons and those weapons go and get destroyed. But most innovation happens during wartime. In fact, most of the things that we take for granted nowadays, whether it was GPS, bug spray, nuclear power, all of these things were birthed out of necessity of war. The military, industrial complex, the government aspect of that, not like the corporate, you know, a Halliburton, Lockheed Martin end of things, but <clears throat> it was that, in, that drives ingenuity. Not only that, it prompts sacrifice. It prompts sacrifice in the nation. And that's really how you, and it also can allow a nation to expand its borders. So people are looking at all of Russia's losses right now. They're not seeing what they've gained by expanding their population, by expanding their territory, by expanding their sphere of influence. These are things that have material value in the end. So yes, while you lose human resources, while you lose resources in the war, you stand to gain a lot as well. So a war economy, and historically as well, is what tends to pull societies out of a depression because they, they prompt a vocational sacrifice on the part of its population and a temporary downgrade in the standard of living for a greater cause, which ultimately does elevate as wasteful as things are. People say, well, yeah, but you know, you're building tanks and tanks just explode. Well, I mean, you're building TVs and they just fall apart. And you know, how many TVs do you need? You know, so anyways, <clears throat> maybe I can do a whole video on war economies. I've done them in the past and that's where we're going. This is a message I got from uh, somebody who's been pretty on point up until this point in time. And they've been holding fast to this nuclear power plant issue when it was way out of the news cycle. And that's why last week I knew that this was going to enter the news cycle again because it is going to be right at the juncture of where this counteroffensive is going to take place. He says that Russians are prepping up an island in the Bay of Finland. I'm going to show you where that island is in just a minute on the map. It used to be a part of Finland, and it's close to the Finnish border. They have set up new radar towers, built helicopter pads, expanded docks. Susuri in English means Grand Island or Big Island. I don't actually think it's that big, you know, relative to Russia anyways. Yesterday in a press conference, rescue inspector Essa Alberg from the Finnish army spewed out that many, or that a new emergency information go to bomb shelter system should be installed before the war activity starts. He also repeated the phrase, coming war actions. Basically making out that this was inevitable. Now, the Finnish Defense Force came out with a statement that there should have been an if in this speech. So, if 
there's a coming war or not, prepare for the coming war. At the same time, the largest civil shelters in Finland, which is very renowned for uh, having a culture of preparedness, have been activated in silence. The Nord Stream investigations are turning into a real shit show over here. Conveniently enough, as the investigations proceed, UK doubles down on their war talk. I don't think that they're able to keep the results of the investigation secret that much longer. The fact that Russia hasn't just acted on this already in the face of the obvious obfuscation of evidence here, and I mean, if they didn't do it, they know they didn't do it. So, and obviously they don't know who done it exactly, and they probably never will, because as Seymour Hirsch explained, it's like a game of telephone. You hire a guy who hires a guy who hires a guy who hires a guy. So it's so far removed from old Sleepy Creepy in Washington that, you know, you can never tie it back or trace it back to any given source. But uh, yeah, this might be, that might be the straw that breaks the camel's back when it officially, if it officially comes out, because I'm not saying, and there's that one chance in hell that the Russians actually blew up their own $20 billion piece of critical infrastructure to get out of some sort of legal liability or whatever the case might be. But let's just, come on, come on, come on, guys, use your brains, use your brains, you still can do it. It's not illegal yet. There's still the bank thing. People are still worried about uh, the banks, the regional banks. Notorious Investor has a dire prediction for people with money in the banks. He thinks that the government's going to put in place restrictions that limit bank runs, that basically make it so that you can't take out a certain amount of money out of the bank. Just another prediction. People are still concerned about the banking crisis. It seems to be happening, but a little slower. And, you know, maybe that whole thing that happened earlier in the year was just to kind of burn people out. It's all about adrenal fatigue with a lot of these stories. But very, very concerning. When you see what happened in the last three years, how powerful groupthink can be, how we can do things collectively as a society that are so monumentally stupid and nobody with enough power and authority and influence can say, can like wake people out of their slumber and we just keep going with it uh, just imagine that only in a nuclear Armageddon potential sense. Not good. Not good at all. Uh, there was this incident with a, a Polish plane. There was a Polish, I think it was a civilian plane. It might have been a spy plane. It, it was a very nondescript uh, military plane, perhaps like some sort of uh, coastal guard. Or, I, I don't know what it was. But anyways, it... Uh, intercepted a, a pole, uh, was intercepted by an Su-35 Russian plane, and now NATO Air Force is on a higher state of alert. This is what I'm talking about when I said last week that the more high intensity the conflict gets, and when the missiles really start flying here, there, and everywhere, when they're trying to intercept missiles, and you got so many different birds in the sky, and friendly fire, and all this stuff, accidents are going to happen. Romania is on high alert, Moldova is on high alert, Poland's on high alert, Belarus. I mean, the whole situation can just spiral out of control really, really fast. I think we're going to see the most level of military activity that we've ever seen thus far when this offensive begins because the Ukrainians are going to have a whole lot of new equipment, as are the Russians, going to have a whole lot of new equipment. The Russians have modified their tanks to be more drone resistant. They're all learning lessons. They're all evolving their uh, types of weapons. The arms race is unfolding. And so I think that this is gonna be, this is gonna be messy. And uh, that's why they are pulling people out of Skadovsk's, Skadovsk's around the Kyrgyzstan region. Ukrainian mil military has revealed that a large portion of Russian occupation administration staff was evacuated. So they're giving people a chance to evacuate because if, and this is where the Ukrainians are playing up on the fear of the Russians, concerned that, you know, there might be reprisals for aiding and abetting the Russian occupiers as they're viewed. Uh, many people are choosing to flee instead. And of course you put that fear in your soldiers and uh, you have many soldiers trying to go AWOL. According to the Ukrainians, the Russians are trying to sneak out as civilians. Well, from what I heard, 
This is just rumor now. I heard that uh, this was happening on both sides in Mariupol. In fact, there were many uh, Ukrainian soldiers who are trying to pretend to be civilians escaping from Mariupol. What do I know? Is this just a good old classic mirroring, a good old projection that's taking place? Who knows? They're starting to mobilize in Mariupol again. The Chechens are heading back into the war. So it's not looking good. They're evacuating 1,600 people from the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant town. I believe that's Enodegar. I can never say that word. As, as BBC puts it, mad panic as Russia evacuates town near Zaporozhye. Mad panic, they say. Russia will panic, according to Ukraine's deputy defense minister. We will launch our counteroffensive when and where. It doesn't matter how. When that happens, Russia will be in panic. You will see a lot of panic. They still don't understand that their propaganda is demonstrating a false picture of what is actually happening on the ground. This war will be won on the ground, not on TV screens. Now, hold on. Hold on a second. This is like classic mirroring. I, I can't let this one slide because the Ukrainians are way better at the PR game than the Russians. Clearly, they have it on lock. Okay, the ability, the videos, they, this has always been their strong suit throughout this entire conflict. So it is somewhat ironic that they're accusing the Russians of doing this. So I just try to see it objectively, guys, because if you're not willing to see these things objectively and you're just starry-eyed and ready to get sent off to war, you're going you're gonna to get hustled and you're going to be taken advantage of in this world. So try to be objective. You're not going to see me here spewing pro-Kremlin talking points and you're certainly not going to see me doing the opposite as well. According to Kalishko, there was a massive attack on Kiev, the biggest since the start of the special military operation. And my phone is ringing. I wonder who that is. But they shot them all down. The Shahid drones appear to not be that effective anymore. So was this just a diversionary tactic or is this the end of the reign of the Shahid drone as a formidable weapon in the Russian arsenal? Like I said, we got fires raging all across Moscow and they got these weird, check this out, okay? So these are X's that are propping up in and around Moscow on the ground. You can't, there is another one there. This is a uh, Twitter post, but there's these red X's. People are unsure, is this something to do with the parade? Is this the route that the parade is gonna take? That's probably what it is. I don't think it's signals for, I don't think, Ukrainians would rely on red X's on the ground to meet their targets. But uh, I guess you never know. You never know. But there, there's definitely tension in the air as a result of the victory parade. Okay. Now, according to the New York Times, like I say, we, we review every news agency here, whether it's Taz, Sputnik, New York Times, NBC, ABC, Fox News, doesn't matter. We try to aggregate all that information and spit out our prediction for you. If Ukrainians fall short of expectations, they risk an erosion of Western support. So this is why Kiev is being pressured. Get in there, move, go fast, go hard, take over the territories, get it over with. If you don't, then we're going to wane in our support. And that's when we're going to jump ship. So they, whereas the Russians see this and what they're trying to say in this article, which is entitled, uh, Ukraine is facing a ticking clock, just talking about the urgency of the counteroffensive, is that the Russians have more time. You know, Putin has more time. He is, after all, pretty much leader for life. So they could muster more political, economic, and industrial staying power, possibly for years. But Ukraine doesn't have that kind of time if they lose this battle. Russia's hope right now is that the peak of Western military support is going to be around summer. That's the hope. Okay, that's according to uh, Michael Kaufman, uh, director of Russia studies at CNA. You always got to be skeptical of somebody who's an expert in Russia studies and works for our side. Already the war has stretched more than 14 months, making a years-long protracted conflict more likely. Here's an interesting factoid. Once wars have gone on for more than a year, they tend to last for more than a decade on average. Interesting. In private conversations, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu has professed a willingness to dig in for the long haul, carry out more mobilizations if necessary, and emphasizing that Russia is capable of conscripting 25 million fighting age men. It's all about economy. That is the strategy. 
it's not even so much a battlefield who can outflank who. It's who can have a stronger economy and bring more resources to the battlefield. That's who's going to win. At the end of the day, when you have armies that are mostly at parity, which is what we're seeing here, for the most part. I mean, the HIMARS are proving to be somewhat disproportionately effective, but we don't know what's going on. Uh, what else do we got? Oh, yeah, so what's going on, Ken? I talk about the wildfire situation. They're out of control right now. It's likely to uh, continue to be a problem, but there is rain in the forecast. With that rain, we're talking about thunderstorms, so we're likely to see even more fires, unfortunately, if uh, the, the rain doesn't override the, uh, or if the lightning overrides the effect of the rain. World food prices are hiking once again. They were up, I believe, another 1.2% last month. After some dropping over the past six to eight months, they're upticking once again. I think we're going to start to see the long effects of the conflict this, later this year. Because last year, Europe was able to stockpile all the energy they needed for the winter. If we have a cold winter this year, they're not going to be able to get through it. Everything is going to go through the roof. I mean, the European economy is already in shambles. It's already collapsing, if you ask me. I mean, what was it? That one banker who came out in the UK the other day and just said, you guys just got to accept the fact that you're going to be poor now. That's all it is. You're going to be poor and uh, you're going to be going to war with the Russians. I mean, whether it was Finland, Poland, the Wagner Group head, the head of the UK military himself, they're all saying that war with Russia is coming. So do they know something we don't about the, the staying power of the conventional uh, aspect of this conflict that the, the, we're going to keep it conventional and it not go nuclear? Could NATO and Russia foreseeably fight a conventional war with each other and it not go nuclear? Only if one side is not, you know, if it's not one-sided affair, then I think it's actually possible that that could happen. We could see some strike on Ramstein Air Base or somewhere in NATO and the only response we get is conventional. If Russia absorbs that conventional attack or is able to parry that attack, then maybe it doesn't go non-conventional. I mean, there are scenarios just because Russia and NATO, and I think this is something that even I'm guilty of, just because they start fighting with each other doesn't ultimately lead to it's going to go nuclear. Okay? It's not an inevitability. Inevitability. Warren Buffett says American incredible period is ending. Warren Buffett purported that the end of the last prosperous period for the U.S. economy is happening now. That should be concerning with record high debt to GDP ratio. That could be concerning with all the dollars floating around and all the talk of de-dollarization and the fact that it appears to be that we're losing the global military stronghold over the planet. That's the most important thing. He who has the greatest amount of guns can protect the vault and can protect the golden credit card is the golden, or sorry, the uh, global reserve currency. Talked about central bank gold buying hitting a record. Close to 190 U.S. banks could collapse, according to USA Today. There's this indicator here. All the indicators are pointing towards recession. So this is... Uh, <laughs> You know, all of these indicators here, the SAM rule recession indicator, I can't remember exactly what this is. It's something to do with the rising unemployment in the last six months. Okay, the, the rising unemployment in the last six months is concerning and it's wildly predicting that there's a 68% chance of a recession. I mean, that's a recession. We can, we can survive a recession, but can we survive a re recession at record high debt levels with the de-dollarization and with the war that's not even really started yet? That is the question. Lastly, Lavrov. He says that the Kremlin drone was a hostile act. This is the top diplomat in Moscow. The Russian foreign defense minister said that this is casus belli, meaning that is Latin for the cause of war. Okay, this is cause for war. So without explicitly saying we declare war on the United States, they said that they will act 
when they deem necessary that NATO will not act with impunity, according to them now. I'm not saying that it's a matter of fact that this was in fact in some way orchestrated by Washington. I'm just saying that's what the Russians perceive it to be. And he's not the only diplomat. These are the ones that don't speak, you know, wildly and sensationally like that uh, Dmitry Medvedev guy. Kiev confirms that Biden administration sponsors terrorism, according to Russian diplomat spokeswoman, uh, what's her face, uh, Maria Zakharova said that, um, I think it was the chief of the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, Ministry's main intelligence directorate, who asserted that Ukraine had, had and will be killing Russians anywhere in the world until the complete victory of Ukraine. So, you know, whether you think that's legitimate, you think that all's fair in love and war, fine, but just know there will be repercussions, possibly of the nuclear sort. The diplomat noted remarks by the chief of the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, uh, who interviewed Yahoo News, question about Kiev's possible involvement in the assassination of Daria Dugina, asserted that Ukraine had been and would be killing Russians anywhere on the face of this world until the complete victory of Ukraine. Okay. It is what it is. The oceans are heating up. This is Climate Reanalyzer. If you want to go and have an objective take on what's going on in the world, they're not trying to sell you on any ideas, but this is just something to take note of. The sea surface temperature anomaly is off the charts this year. Anything in red or orange is abnormally high temperatures in the oceans. The or in order to bring the ocean up, even a 0.001 degree, it takes a lot of energy. This year, I can't remember what it was, but it was abnormally high, like scary high. So there's concern that this is going to have some uh, effects. I guess we'll just see. We shall just see. So on this website, you can go to sea surface temperature anomaly. That's that. You can also go, you can see the jet stream, how discombobulated that is. You can see two temperature, uh, or sorry, two meter temperature anomaly, which has, for the most part, for the duration of this year, been abnormally high as well. Anywhere in red, once again, is going to be unseasonably high temperatures. Anywhere that's cooler colors is going to be, you know, your, uh, your lower temperatures, lower than average temperatures. So right now, in and around the place where the fires are burning, this warm front just passed. So it was unusually warm temperatures. Now we're getting another bit of a, a mild front, not a cold front, because cold is going to be like really, really dark blues or abnormally. And this is relative. So just because a place is orange and red doesn't mean that there's not snow there. That just means above the average temperature. So it's warmer than average as it is there. The Arctic is melting. Uh, just what it is. Whether you believe it or not, that's what's happening. And yeah, go to firesmoke.ca if you want to get a real time. And it gives you a projection too. So you can predict when the smoke is going to be coming to your region. So according to this map, if we go out all the way, like if we project out here, Calgary is going to get hit with a big blast of smoke tomorrow at around tomorrow morning. When you wake up in Calgary tomorrow morning, you're going to be surrounded by smoke. If you aren't already right now, uh, it's going to dissipate and it's going to come back. Okay. What else do we got? Yeah, go check out our videos that we released over the weekend, guys. Uh, we did some uh, sandbag testing and uh, you got to get yourself some sandbags. This is probably one of the most underestimated preps that is one of the most widely used things in disaster and emergency preparedness. But for preppers, we underestimate the importance of a sandbag, not only for home fortifications, but obviously uh, for flooding, for just shelter construction, forward fighting positions, defensive positions, you name it. If things get Mad Max, which they very well could in the case of a post-nuclear world, then uh, we may well see this. But yeah, we did all kinds of tests. We go over the different types of sandbags. We build some sandbags with the kids. And uh, right now we have a 20% off deal, high quality sandbags. These things cost a lot to ship. It's not so much the price of the individual sandbags, it's the cost of shipping. And right now shipping is still through the roof. And also, if you need chronic medications, we did a video that dropped yesterday. We were the first ones to uh, work with this company. This is Jace Medical, 800 
chronic medications are now available for you to stockpile. Many people are very concerned about if you have medications that you rely on to keep you alive or just to keep you at a state of homeostasis and so that you can function, then you're gonna need those medications or just enough to wean you off so that you can find some other natural supplement. And that's a service that is game changing, revolutionary. You don't have to go into your doctors and have that awkward conversation about how you're preparing with the end of the world. Jace Medical has now made it, so they're going to facilitate you having that conversation with an anonymous doctor. It's somebody you meet, a certified licensed physician, but you're gonna do that through teleconference and it's quick, it's painless. You have a quick video chat or email or phone call and then you can get your uh, long, uh, like a one year supply, I think, of your prescriptions fulfilled, okay? And you can also get a supply of antibiotics. So it's a game changer, guys. And tomorrow we're gonna be talking about something else that most people don't do, and it's the reason why 90% of people are gonna die when shit hits the fan. Anyways, I've been talking for damn near an hour, so I'm gonna let you guys go. Please go and check out that video in the description section below. Thanks for watching Canadian Prepper out.